in our modern times, when somebody travels, books, hotel reservations, they're able to put all of their information into the computer system before even getting to their destination. This, of course, has made our check-in process a lot faster than back in, say, the 90s. Because of this new technology, the hiding of identity is harder to do. Back in the 90s, though, the hiding of an identity or carrying an alias was a lot easier to do. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and to all of our producers. Without you, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta, and today we're finally back with a Mystery Monday where we are going to be talking about Jennifer Fairgate. I'm so happy to be back bringing you a Monday mystery. This Monday mystery was actually scheduled for last week, but as you guys know, YouTube gave me a forced week off. With that being said, please look down in the description box below and go ahead and subscribe to our platform on Rumble as well. We're going to keep bulldozing through regardless of what happens. We're, we know that we're at the precipice of change, so they're not going to stop us. I'm also going to be opening up a second YouTube channel. I'm not really sure what that's going to look like as of yet. It might just be an Esoteric Atlanta 2.0 or it might be a completely different name, kind of like what our friend Janine does. She has Tarot by Janine, and then she also has Sending Ravens by Tarot by Janine. I still haven't decided yet, but I am going to create that soon. So once that is posted, go ahead and subscribe to that as well, so you guys know where I am. If something happens, you'll be able to find me. Thank you again to all of the patrons and producers you guys really helped us get through that week, and I am so appreciative of all of you. All of you are just such powerful, wonderful, special, beautiful people, and it is an honor to be on this journey with you. Now, while this is airing to you this particular day that this is being released to you, I am actually not in Atlanta. I'm filming from Atlanta right now, but this is obviously being delayed because of the, the forced rest that YouTube gave me. Um, I am going to be actually very close to New Orleans while this is being aired to you guys. And so I don't know if I'm going to be able to get into New Orleans at this point. We're all just taking it a week at a time or a day at a time as it, as it is. But while we're close to New Orleans, if I can get into New Orleans and film and do some filming, I'm planning on doing that for you guys. I can't promise anything though because like I said, there's just so much in the air right now. Who knows what the next day is going to bring, but hopefully I will be able to do that for you. If I can't do that now, then hopefully in the future I'll be able to do that where I can go and film some of these places that we've uh, spoken about on our New Orleans series. I especially want to get to the Littlewoods area so I can talk to them about their creatures, but we'll see. we'll see what happens. All right, let's get started with Jennifer Fairgate. So I would never heard of this case before, and when I was researching for another series that we're going to be doing on Mystery Monday about missing people in national parks, I stumbled upon this lady. She was not, she did not go missing in a national park. She's a totally different case all on her own. And actually, Netflix series, their reboot of Unsolved Mysteries, covered her. However, we're going to be looking at this through the eyes of people who have a 20-20 vision. These types of cases fascinate me. Oh my god, they fascinate me so much, and I cannot wait to hear your opinion on this particular lady. The Radisson Blue Plaza Hotel, 
or just known as the Oslo Plaza by locals, is a five-star luxury hotel located in Oslo, Norway. It consists of 673 rooms and contains 37 floors. It is Norway's second tallest building. This is a hotel that services celebrities, kings, queens, royalty, and even political diplomats. According to the reboot of Unsolved Mysteries, they talk about how this hotel specifically holds secret meetings between different rulers of different countries. This is super important pertaining to our story with Jennifer Fairgate. With all this being said, the Oslo Plaza Hotel was not a hotel that you would just randomly walk into to see if there was a room available. And it certainly, certainly is not that of a hostel situation that a young traveler might be attracted to, a place to just drop bags off while the said young traveler gets to explore the city of Oslo. No, this hotel again was luxurious. It took somebody with money and somebody who had an interest in being at the hotel while while they were in Oslo, whether that was for diplomatic reasons or whether you were someone on vacation but also wanted to have a luxurious stay in your residence and not just experience the country or the city itself. On the evening of Monday, May 22nd, 1995, a young woman called the Oslo Plaza Hotel to book a reservation. It is noted that the woman who called spoke in fluent English. Now, no one from what I have seen or researched could specify which variation of English this woman, this particular woman was fluent in. Was it fluent American, like the way I speak? Was it fluent English, like the way our friend Tom Numbers speak? Fluent Australian, like our friend Tamara speaks? Now, you might not think that's super important. You might think, oh, they just recognized it was fluent English. But there's a reason why I'm asking this question, which we will return to later on in the story. And this, in my opinion, might also help us understand who Jennifer Fairgate really was. Well, by Wednesday, May 31st, this young woman called the Oslo Plaza Hotel back. It seems that she wanted to change her reservation and would be coming in later that evening. Although this time, the young woman, the same young woman who had called on Monday, spoke fluent German. Now, the person who took her phone call in the hotel, the cashier, did say that this version of German sounded Eastern German. She also informed the front desk that it would not just be her using the room, but there would be one other person accompanying her on her stay at the Oslo Plaza Hotel. Now, yes, I know there are many, many, many people in this world who speak multiple languages, especially in a continent like Europe, where there are so many different languages being spoken not that far apart from each other. However, once again, this information might indeed help us figure out who this person really was. Obviously, though, for the front desk, there used to probably get many people calling in who speak many different languages, especially in an international city like Oslo. At roughly 10.40 p.m. on Wednesday night, the 31st of May of 1995, the woman who had booked this reservation walked into the Oslo Plaza Hotel. She was a small woman, about five foot two, maybe around 140 pounds, short black hair, blue eyes, but seemingly just kind of merged into the crowd. And a crowd it was. At this particular time of night, a lot of flights had just flown into Oslo. And so there were many guests from all over the world standing in line to check into this five-star luxury hotel. Now, they always say that hindsight is 2020, and the two eyewitness accounts of everything that happened in the lobby that, that night tend to differ. 
One of the employees claims that this woman was there by herself, while another employee claims that the woman was there indeed with a companion. Now, the man that was with her, according to the one witness that says he was there, was about six feet tall. That's quite a big height difference between someone who is 5'2 and six feet. Jennifer herself, this woman, appeared to be quite young in her early 20s, while her companion, this man, seemed to be between the ages of 35 and 40. This man was also seen by this witness exchanging American currency to the Norwegian kroner. This is why, again, I am curious to know what version of English this woman was fluent in. Again, this was 1995. And even though in 1995 the world was still small compared to 100 years prior, but it was still bigger than it is now. People did still travel a lot around the world, but for a young woman and a middle-aged man to have all this American money, but yet not be possibly American, is odd to me. Now, Jennifer was the one who checked them into the hotel, again, while the man was allegedly exchanging currency as one of the eyewitnesses saw. But again, the other eyewitness only saw Jennifer. We have to remember again that the hotel was really, really, really busy. All these flights had come in. It was a madhouse. People were trying to check in. And because it was a five-star luxury hotel, of course, the employees were trained to get their customers through reception as quickly as possible. Could it be that this other eyewitness just missed the fact that there was a guy who was with Jennifer that was exchanging money? He just didn't see him. Could he have seen him out of his peripheral vision and just assumed they were two separate parties? Who knows? But again, hindsight is twenty twenty. These people are trying to remember a night that probably seemed just like any other busy night in an international hotel when a lot of people were coming in at the same time. Well, when Jennifer got up to the front desk, she was handed a form to fill out for her check-in. This is what I kind of alluded to in the beginning because nowadays in our modern times, if I'm going to go to a five-star hotel or even just a regular old travel hotel, most likely I'm going to get online and I'm going to go ahead and book my room online. I'm going to fill out all my information. I'm going to go ahead and give my credit card number so that by the time I get to the hotel, it's a really quick check-in process. They just check you in, give you a key, boom, you're done. However, that wasn't the case in 1995. Even though we did have computers and the internet was on the rise, most businesses still did things by longhand. So on this form, Jennifer had to fill out certain information about herself. Her name had already been typed into the form because she had already called previously to make the reservations. Now there is a discrepancy in her last name. The employee who started out her card wrote her name as Jennifer Fairgate, F-A-I-R-G-A-T-E, as in going to the fair, Fairgate. However, Jennifer signed her name as Jennifer Fergate, F-E-R-G-A-T-E. Now this in itself is not odd. And if this was the only discrepancy on the check-in paper, then you could say, oh, the employee who took her information just misheard her. Fairgate, Fair Fergate sounds very similar. No harm, no foul. However, there are other things on her sign-in sheet that don't add up. For example, she gave her address as Rue de la Stead in Verlaine, Belgium. Now, Verlaine, Belgium is a town in Belgium that exists. It's a very, very, very small town. One of those small towns that you wouldn't really know it was there unless you knew it was there. For example, unless you actually were from that town or had some type of connection to that town. I think the local population at this time is only around like 5,000 people. Now, Rue de la Stead is a street in Verlaine that simply does not exist. She also wrote down that her zip code was 7968. However, the real zip code for Verlaine is 4537. She wrote down the area code to her phone number was 068. 068 
does connect to Belgium, but not to Verlaine. Verlaine's area code is 014. Now, none of these discrepancies on her sign-in sheet would be noticed until long after her passing and the investigation into her. I mean, it's a busy night. She's filling things out. She's handing it back to the check-in guy. He's just taking it, giving her keys, going about her business. But there are some really crucial things on this form that she just did not touch. That was her passport number and her credit card number. It is believed that Jennifer did give some cash for the first few nights of her stay in this hotel. However, at a five-star luxury hotel, they also need a credit card number. This has to do with like ordering pay-per-view, which we'll get to, taking snacks out of the mini bar, which again, we'll get to, ordering room service. Most of you guys know what what I'm talking about. Probably nowadays, almost every hotel you stay in, be it five star or not, is going to ask you for a credit card number. I think probably the only residents or hotels, motels that don't ask for credit card numbers now are probably more like hostels or real cheap pay by the hours types of hotels, if you know what I mean. Jennifer also wrote that she worked for a country that she worked for a company called Service in Belgium. However, there's no such company in Belgium that exists. And since we now know that Jennifer Fairgate is not the name of the woman who checked in, the whole check-in form was simply made up by this woman. This woman did also enter in the name Lewis, Lewis Fairgate. This supposedly was the man, her companion, that she said would be joining her. Once again, one of the cashiers did spot a man that she thought was with Jennifer exchanging American currency for Kroner, but we're not for sure if that was actually him or not. Beyond that, nobody ever saw this Lewis Fairgate. Now the big kicker in the beginning was again not getting the credit card number and this will come into play throughout this story. Now the managers of the Oslo Plaza Hotel said that this was a complete unfathomable oversight that they did not get her passport number nor her credit card. This just did not happen in their rules and regulations for this five-star luxury hotel. However, the employees who worked the front desk had a different story. Yes, yeah, sure, management probably was completely humiliated that they didn't have the essential information on the checking card, but the employees who worked the front desk said, no, 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 this oversight does happen sometimes, especially when the lobby is really busy. Once again, they want to make sure that their clients, their customers are taken care of in a rapid speed so that they can get into their hotel rooms. After all, this is a business and no business wants a bad reputation. As one employee said, the people did not want to keep the guest waiting. And let's be honest, nine times out of 10, when you're checking somebody into a hotel and there's some stuff missing on the form and you go ahead and give them the key, that mistake will probably be corrected in the next day or two. Most people are not trying to scan the system and most people would be very willing to come back and fill in whatever was mistakenly looked over in the earlier process. I don't think anybody that night on Wednesday, May 31st, 1995, working at that hotel had any idea what was about to unfold in the next few days at their hotel regarding this one particular guest. Now, knowing what we know now, or rather what we don't know now about who this Jennifer really was, I speculate that Jennifer called and changed her check-in time because she was watching the flights coming into Oslo. I personally do believe that Jennifer, or whoever she was, came into the lobby at that particular time because she knew she knew the front desk would be busy, and she knew that she had a better chance of hiding her identity and not giving away certain information that would show her identity to the front desk, which again is exactly what happened. 
After handing in the fake form, the incomplete and totally made up form, to the person at the front desk, they proceeded to give her two hotel card keys. Now we've all experienced these hotel card keys that you slip in, it opens the door and you enter your room. These keys have magnets in them that can connect down to the system at the front desk. This allows people to see how many times somebody enters the room. Now, what it can't do and what it doesn't do is tell you how many times somebody exited the room because you don't have to use the card key to lock the door. The door just locks on its own once it shuts and you use your key to reopen it. I mean, I know I've done this so many times where I've walked out of my hotel room without carrying that key, the door is shut behind me and I've been locked out of the room, therefore having to go to the front desk and get a whole new key to my hotel room because it just automatically locks on its own. Now here's the kicker too, and I'm going to put up a timeline of how many times this card key was actually used. The one thing we don't know though, if somebody was in the room, if you had a companion in your room and you knocked on the door, the companion could just open the door for you, therefore you don't have to use your key card. So were there times in this timeline where Jennifer entered her hotel room that weren't logged because there was somebody else in the room? Well that we don't know. From what I understand, the hotel did have cameras up that could have given us some information. However, the police destroyed that evidence about a year after the case was officially closed, which is very suspicious to me. So let's get started with what we do know about Jennifer's movement from Wednesday evening to the time her body was discovered. In hotel room 2805 was 10.44 p.m. that Wednesday evening. That makes sense because she checked in around 10.40, so very quick check-in, four minutes, and then she was up to her hotel room, sliding the key into the door to enter. The key was also used again at 12.21 a.m. on Thursday. There were some reports that people saw her by the elevator right before this in the lobby. Again, some people say that she was alone, while other people say there was a man with her. So she obviously stepped out at some point right after getting into her room, went down for something, and then came back up less than two hours later, about an hour and a half later, to come back into her room. Now the card was used again to enter the room at 8.34 a.m. on Thursday. So between 12.21 a.m. and 8.34 a.m. she had left again, coming back at 8.34. So before she used her hotel card key at 8.34 a.m. on the Thursday, she did go back down to the lobby and request an extension on her stay. She wanted to move her checkout day to Sunday. Now the extension was granted and she was given two new card keys for room 2805. Now the odd thing is, is at this time when she went to go extend her stay, no one bothered to ask her yet again for her passport number or for her credit card number. Now after the 8.34 a.m. entrance on Thursday, she does not use her key again until 8.50 a.m. that Friday. This is approximately 24 hours where we have no idea where Jennifer was. Now the police ruled Jennifer, Jennifer's as Janine says, leaving of the earth plane as her decision to leave the earth plane, if you know what I mean, because they believe that she literally just held herself up in this hotel room, preparing herself mentally for what she was going to do. And that's why we don't see her using the card key for over 24 hours. She was just hanging out in the room. However, at 1 p.m. on that Thursday, so in between that 24-hour period, the maids came in to clean the room and the room was completely empty. The maids also noted that they knew that there were two people registered to this hotel room, but 
only one of the pillows had been used and only one of the duvets had been used, signifying that there was probably only one person in there that night. Now, many people have speculated what she was doing for the 24 hours that she was gone from the room since the maids seemed to back the hypothesis that she wasn't there, although the police will tell you differently. Some people speculate that she might have known someone in Oslo and therefore went to stay with them for the night. People have also speculated that there was somebody else in the hotel that she knew and therefore went to stay with them that night. Some people speculate that she went out sightseeing and then maybe got caught up in the nightlife of Oslo and didn't wander back in until the early morning hours of Friday. Now again, I mentioned this in the beginning, if you're young, which this girl was young, she on her check-in form, she put that she was 21 years old. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But that young, you could say that, yes, if you're traveling that young, you probably want to go out and see the nightlife and see that you don't want to hang out in the hotel. People that young who tend to go out and, and really party and travel in their party and sightsee in their travels are usually going to stay at like a hostel or a cheaper boarding house, as most, again, most young people do. Not in a five-star luxury hotel, so that's strange. Now, people have speculated that she was perhaps, as a profession, a smuggler or maybe even a sex worker, but most people believe that Jennifer was indeed a spy. Now, according to a specialist, someone who used to work for Secret Services, the fact that Jennifer was gone for over 24 hours indicates to him that this is the case. According to him, people who are spies, when they come into a city or a town, they will book two accommodations. They'll have a backup accommodation in case they feel like something has gone wrong at their original accommodation that has more to do with their job while they're there. And so therefore they'll go stay at the backup accommodation for a night just to clear the area in case somebody is on to them. In my opinion, makes the most sense, and we're gonna get into that in a minute. So after Jennifer entered the room at 8.50 a.m., she then enters the room for a final time at 11.03 a.m. that Friday. Now, a maid in the hallway did see Jennifer at this time at 11.03 a.m., and apparently Jennifer did say good morning to the maid in English before entering into her room. Once she entered into the room, she placed a do not disturb sign on the door. Now, something else happens in the 24 hours where she did not use her key card. At this time, the hotel did notice that she did not leave her credit card information and they send a notice to her room through the television. This was high tech for 1995. Basically, on the TV, a screen would pop up and tell the occupant of the room to contact the front desk to give them this information. Now, with this notice that popped up on the TV screen, the TV could not be used until the occupant of the room hit OK on the remote to acknowledge the message. Well, once the first message was seen, the message was not acknowledged by anyone in the room. It stayed up on the TV for many, 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 many hours. Again, leading us to believe that there was nobody in the room to see the message. The message was then acknowledged at 8.50 a.m. on Friday when we know Jennifer used her key card again. Even though the message was acknowledged by Jennifer or whoever she was in the room, nobody came down to remedy the problem. They just ignored it. Now, Friday evening at 8.06 p.m., Jennifer orders room service. The food is delivered at 8.23 p.m. The woman who brought Jennifer her room service said that she remembered the room being extremely, extremely neat, almost sanitary. She said it didn't take her a long time to set up her meal because the desk had nothing on it. So it was very quick and easy. She also remembered Jennifer because Jennifer tipped her a 50 kroner note. 
That apparently is a very large tip. This woman said that before, if you had gotten a 10 kroner tip, you thought you were lucky. But a 50 kroner tip, well, that was quite, quite a large tip. After Jennifer orders room service, she orders a pay-per-view video. We have no idea what the movie was, what language it was in, nothing like that. We just know that she did order a movie. At 8.57 p.m., the front desk sends another message. This is the third message up to room 2805 at Jennifer Fairgate's room to say that she needs to contact the front desk to provide her credit card information. Once again, somebody in the room, Jennifer immediately acknowledged the message, but did not leave her room to come down to remedy the situation. After the acknowledgement of the last message at 8.57 p.m. that Friday night, the whole of Saturday goes by without anybody seeing Jennifer leave her hotel room. At 7.30 p.m. Saturday evening, the hotel decides that they're going to one more time send a message up to room 2805 to remind the occupant to please come see the front desk to hand over their credit card information. Once again, the message was acknowledged by somebody hitting the OK button on the remote, but nobody came downstairs. At this point, the employees are starting to get a little bit impatient with the occupant of room 2805. They decide that they're going to send a maid up to see if the maid could physically knock on the door and tell Jennifer to please come down to the front desk. The maid goes up, but immediately comes back down saying that the do not disturb sign was still on the door. This puts the employees of a five-star hotel in a little bit of an awkward situation. They want to be respectful to their guests, and if a guest has a do not disturb sign on the door, they don't want to disturb them. And it could just be that the guest is planning on coming down to the front desk once they're ready and handing over the credit card information. However, the message had now been sent multiple times to the room. The message had been acknowledged. The occupant in the room had ordered room service and gotten a movie off of pay-per-view and had still neglected to hand over her credit card info. The front desk decides that at this point they're going to send a security guard up. They're not thinking, obviously, that there's anything super, super dastardly happening in the room. I love that word. That's what Janine uses. But they want to make sure that the guest in the room isn't planning on skipping out on the bill and not ever handing over the rest of the payment for incidentals. The security guard heads up to the hotel room. Around 7.50 p.m., 20 minutes after the last message, was sent to the television. He knocks on the door and he hears what sounds like a go off. The security guard did not know what to do at that point, so he ran around the corner and waited for a minute. He decided to eventually just go back down to the lobby and see if he can get the head of security, who would most likely have better protection himself, to enter into this room. The head of security arrives at room 2805, Jennifer Fairgate's room, at around 8.04 p.m. This gives us about 14 minutes between the time they heard the to the time the head of security showed up where the room was not being watched. Once again, I did know... I did note in the beginning of this story that there allegedly was videotape of the hotel at this time, but the police have since, from what I understand, gotten rid of the evidence. Now, the head of security had like a special key. The door to room 2805 had been double locked, so the maids or regular security would not have been able to get in anyway. Only the head of security had this particular key where he could get through the double locking. He opened up the room and yelled out to asking the occupant to please make his or herself known. And of course, there was dead silence. As soon as he got into the room and walked to the bed, he noticed Jennifer lying on the bed, fully dressed in pantyhose, high-heeled shoes, and nice evening clothes, lying on her back with her feet on the floor and a right in the middle of her head. 
the mysterious Jennifer Fairgate was no longer with us. The police arrived at the hotel around 8.30 p.m. and what they found was a very strange sight indeed. As they started to go through Jennifer's possessions in the hotel room to try to figure out who she was, they noticed that all the labels on her clothes had been taken off. Not only had the labels and all of her clothes been taken off, but the labels on her shoes had also been taken off. Oddly enough, within all of her clothing in the hotel room, she had no garments for her lower body. Everything left were garments like shirts, jackets, and sweaters to cover her upper body. According to the specialist that was interview, who knows a thing or two about spy networks, this is very common for spies to remove any type of indication that would show somebody where they were from or where they had been, including, again, labels. For example, if there's a chain of stores here in America that sell specific clothes that don't exist anywhere else in the world and someone saw that label, they will know that you had either spent some time in America or, you know, or from America. Same with other countries. So that makes sense to me. Now, again, the police immediately went to rule this a as I said earlier, they believed that Jennifer had kept herself up into her room to prepare herself for what eventually was going to happen. But all the evidence does not point to that. For example, Jennifer was dressed up and it appeared that she had had a shower very near to the time of her leaving the earth plane. There were wet towels on the floor of the bathroom and the soap and the shampoo had been used. However, there were no toiletries. They could not find any toothbrush, toothpaste, makeup, deodorant. Nothing like that was left in Jennifer's room. But they knew Jennifer wore makeup because the body had eyeliner on. The only toiletry that was left was that of men's cologne. While going through her things, they found no wallet, no passport, and no identification whatsoever. Driver's license, even a freaking library card, a blockbuster card, nothing like that existed to give any type of indication of who Jennifer was really. However, in her briefcase was something super interesting. Within her briefcase was 25 Now the way Jennifer was holding was not typical of somebody who does this type of act on themselves with a gun. And on top of that, there was no blood splatter on her hands. From what we understand, people who do this to themselves typically will have blood splatter on their hands once they're done. Autopsy reports also indicate that Jennifer was a lot older than she placed on her check-in card. Now there's a lot more that goes into the case, but unfortunately due to the terms of service of this platform, I won't be able to go into them. Instead, I would just encourage you to look into this case yourself because a lot of the stuff I can't go into will be less listed in a lot of case files. I think most people do agree that Jennifer was probably involved in some sort of secret service operation. For which country, we have no idea, and what happened, we have no idea. The story of Jennifer has been brought all over the world in different languages to different countries, and no one has come to claim her as their child, their sister, their lover, their friend, no one. Jennifer's body was held for about a year after her passing, and then she was buried in Oslo. There's no gravestone to mark her, and no one showed up for the service except for the pallbearers who were kind of like hired to be there by the government. All I know is that every human's life is important. And even though the mystery of Jennifer Fairgate is intriguing and interesting, I do hope that there are people out there mourning her passing, even if they feel like they can't say anything for whatever reason. Now, of course, I will be asking Janine about this case at some point. But beyond that, I would love to know your opinions down in the comment section below. Please be careful about the words you're saying. 
you know, if you need to like put little squiggly lines in between certain words to throw off the AI, then I would truly, truly appreciate it. You guys know all the stress that we're under, especially when the platform keeps changing the rules and making it even more harder just to communicate. There's like this point like over 300 words now that we can't say it's ridiculous but here we are we're here now so I appreciate your patience and your love and support and I will talk to you guys soon bye